Wonderful. As you're taking your seats, a uh, question has been asked about the uh, PowerPoint and the pictures that I showed you. Uh, it's too large to email, but uh, watch on our New Testament Studies website, and you'll, uh, I'll be posting all of that on the website, and you'll be able to download those and use them as you like. Uh, so let me now uh, introduce Craig Blomberg. It is our real honor to have him here with us. Uh, Craig and Kevin, by the way, both uh, were among the readers of the 1 Corinthians commentary volume, and their uh, comments have all been uh, very helpful and taken into account as we've uh, done the final editing and uh, preparation of the ebook for release. Let me explain also that the ebooks, and be sure we have your email address so we can uh, get that to you as soon as it's ready, which will probably be in another week or maybe 10 days. Uh, but as soon as the ebook publication mode is advantageous because every time we want to make a correction or an addition and we do that, you automatically receive a new version of the ebook. Now, this means you don't want to be making a lot of comments and things like that on the ebook itself because every time it's replaced, you lose your comments. Uh, but at least you have the updated latest version. Since scholarship is always a work in progress, this will allow us, uh, even after the print version comes out later in the year, uh, to keep you current uh, if you'd like. Now, if you don't want that service, you can let us know and we'll take your name off of that list. I assume that can be done. But with that, let me uh, welcome Craig Blomberg. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree from Augustana College and an MA in Trinity at, from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and earned his PhD at Aberdeen University in Scotland, specializing there in uh, parables and in the writing of Luke Acts. He is currently a distinguished professor of New Testament at Denver Seminary. He has written numerous articles, including uh, more than 20 books. Best known in our circles is the book that he and Steve Robinson co collaborated on, How Wide the Divide, a Mormon, in, a Mormon and an Evangelical in Conversation. Uh, for our purposes today, uh, his books on the reliability of the Gospels may be of great interest to you. Also, he has done commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew, James, and 1 Corinthians. So, Craig, with all of that, please come to the microphone. We welcome you. Everyone join me in welcoming Craig Brandon. This is the advance. Okay, great. Well, thank you for uh, welcoming an intruder into your midst. <laughs> My uh, slideshow is not nearly as exciting as uh, uh, Professor Welch's was, but uh, um, as we go through chapter by chapter, making some very selective comments on uh, the commentary, I thought uh, for those of you that, that don't have uh, all of the contents of 1 Corinthians uh, memorized or brought a Bible with you, that uh, I would simply use their uh, section headings uh, and scripture references uh, chapter by chapter so you can see both what uh, they did in subdividing the text and labeling each part as well as perhaps have your uh, mind jogged by, uh, by the contents that we'll be talking about. In 2013, Richard Draper and Michael Rhodes published the inaugural volume of the BYU New Testament commentary series. This was a landmark volume for a landmark series, the most extensive treatment of the book of Revelation by far in a commentary format by Latter-day Saint authors for a series that promises to be the most extensive treatment of the New Testament in a commentary series by Latter-day Saint authors. Even more impressively, from my point of view, a significant amount of the scholarship with which Draper and Rhodes interacted came from outside Mormon circles, and of that, the largest percentage came from evangelical Christian circles. At the same time, 
The volume was plentifully punctuated by quotations from Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, later LDS presidents, and other general authorities over the years. Indeed, each section contained the biblical passage at hand reproduced from the Society of Biblical Literature's edition of the Greek New Testament, the King James Version, and a more accurate translation in contemporary English called the BYU Rendition. But no amount of careful translation or scholarship was ever allowed to trump cherished LDS pronouncements by key authorities, and differences in the Joseph Smith translation were always noted. Draper and Rhodes have now collaborated again to produce the volume on 1 Corinthians, utilizing the identical format. In my estimation, it is even better than their very solid and substantial commentary on Revelation. A detailed introduction sets the stage for Paul's letter by surveying questions of authorship, date, historical background to Corinth, circumstances for writing, unifying themes, and as a special bonus, collection of interpretations and famous quotations by LDS authorities for each chapter of the letter, organized in decreasing order of the frequency of comments on the chapter. As is recognized by virtually every recent scholar of any theological perspective who has studied 1 Corinthians in depth, Paul wrote this letter in the mid-50s of the first century to a fledgling church he helped to found against the backdrop of all kinds of cultural challenges that often kept it immature, pagan philosophies, rampant sexual immorality, a port city with all the commerce and merchants coming and going that you would expect from one, clashes of widespread multiculturalism, and the pervasive Greco-Roman practice of patronage, the handful of wealthy in the church, as in Greco-Roman society more generally, were wielding an inordinate amount of power over those indebted to them for their financial well-being. This explains a disproportionate number of the problems in Corinth, from factions to lawsuits, from participation in pagan festivals to abuses of the sacraments, and it accounts for why Paul refuses to accept their money for his ministry, even as he argues for the right for full-time workers for the gospel to receive it. As one begins reading the commentary proper, chapter by chapter and passage by passage, one is treated early on to a marvelous excursus on grace, which should warm any Christian's heart, after Paul's first use of the term in 1.3. An extensive paragraph from this excursus, summarizing Paul's understanding of grace, merits citation in full. Quoting, For Paul, in its deepest theological sense, charis, refers to God's positive predisposition to favor and bless his children. But because God's actions are motivated by grace, they are freely given. The core meaning of charis as a gift should always be remembered. Indeed, grace is expressed through a gift, gesture, or benefit that is neither merited nor earned. Therefore, since God calls a person to grace, that is, God gives it to him, the individual has no claim on it, or is it given because he deserves it? Rather, it predates the individual's goodness or righteousness and is extended to him even as a sinner. Its power, however, is displayed in the overcoming of sin. It is important to understand that grace is unilateral and independent of the receiver. In every case, God makes the first move. It is this that makes it possible for the individual to respond graciously and to move from grace to grace. But the absolutely essential element of that transaction is that God moves first in each instance, giving the person gracious gifts and then additional gifts, rather than the person first exercising his or her goodness and then being rewarded with earned blessings." Close quote. There's not a word here that evangelical Christians should not welcome and embrace wholeheartedly. <clears throat> 
Indeed, later on in this same excursus, our authors clarify 1 Nephi 25, 23, for it is by grace we are saved after all we can do, as meaning above and beyond all we can do. It is not that we do all we can and then God's grace kicks in. After all, they explain it is always theoretically possible that we could have done more so that we would never experience God's grace if he waited to bestow it until we had done our very best possible. Alma 24, 10 to 12, moreover, shows that all we can do is, in fact, to, quote, come before the Lord in reverent humiliation, confess our weaknesses, and plead for his forgiveness, for his mercy and grace, close quote. The treatment of the foolishness of the cross in 118 to 25 is equally powerful and aptly described as is Paul's determination to know nothing but Christ and him crucified in 2.2. Here Paul is particularly combating the sophist philosophers of his day who proliferated in Corinth, emphasizing style above substance in their oratory. Paul demonstrates in his epistles that he can use very effective rhetorical devices, but it is not these devices, but the Spirit's power on which he relies if he is to produce anything of value for Christ and his kingdom. With various other commentators, Draper and Rhodes take the spiritual person in 2, 6 to 16 to be a subset of all believers as it clearly is in 3, 1 to 23. But with a majority of recent commentators, it seems better to me to see that 2, 6 to 16 contrasts all Christians with all non-Christians, spiritual versus natural people, to use the King James Version language, with Paul introducing a type of contrast among Christians only in chapter 3 spiritual versus carnal Christians. In chapter 3, then, there are two, but only two types of believers on Judgment Day, when each person's work will be tried as by fire, that is, it will be put to the test to show its quality. That quality is determined largely by the motivation that stood behind it. If its purpose was for vain glory, self-promotion, fame, or power, it will fail the test. If it was to promote the ends of the kingdom, bring people to Christ Jesus, or for the glory of God, it will pass. Close quote. In chapter 4, Draper and Rhodes rightly recognize how the beginning of verse 8 is dripping with irony and sarcasm as Paul rebukes the Corinthians for their overly exalted self estimation. You already have enough, you already are rich the BYU rendition. The next half verse makes his irony clear. Indeed, I wish you had become kings so that we might rule with you. Instead, the apostles suffer and are mistreated in just about every way imaginable. As in the New International Version, the BYU rendition captures the force of verse 13 and of Paul's self-deception powerfully by rendering the Greek, we have become the scum of the earth. The waters become a little muddier with chapter 5. It is true that about half of the commentators of all theological stripes see the incestuous man whom Paul disciplines by proxy here actually dying, excommunicated for the destruction of the flesh, verse 5. But the blood atonement notion of Joseph Fielding Smith that Christ's death was insufficient to cover certain kinds of sins so that this man's death was what atoned for him goes well beyond what the text ever says. As I understand it, it's not a doctrine taught in the standard works, not accepted by all LDS, so I'm surprised that our authors feel compelled to support it. They have already noted, moreover, that flesh here most likely means sinful nature, not body. Why not proceed then to interact with the other main interpretation of this passage is what puzzles me. Surely it is more likely that this offender is the same man who repented in 2 Corinthians 2 and 7, 
and whom Paul requests the Corinthians reinstate, lest his grief be excessive. In that case, he clearly didn't die, much less atone for his own sin. With chapter 6, things seem to get back on track again. Draper and Rhodes recognize that Paul does not prohibit all redress for wrongs in forbidding secular lawsuits by Christians against Christians. It's merely that they should be settled within the church instead, 6, 1 to 8. Our authors realize that the warning against people who persistently do evil, not inheriting the kingdom of God, verses 9 to 11, is not a list of some kind of unforgivable sins, but refers to those who refuse to repent of them. And the commentary rightly notes that the two words used for homosexual activity refer to the more active and the more passive partner in homosexual acts, respectively. No orientation is being condemned, just the way in which some choose to act upon it. Near the end of the discussion, Gordon B. Hinckley is appropriately quoted, our hearts reach out to those who struggle with feelings of affinity for the same gender, we remember you before the Lord. We sympathize with you. We regard you as our brothers and our sisters. However, we cannot condone immoral practices on your part any more than we can condone immoral practices on the part of others. Close quote. 1 Corinthians 7 presents the interpreter with a hornet's nest of problems, but our commentators navigate their way through it reasonably deftly. Like many modern translations, the BYU rendition puts, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, in verse 1, in quotation marks. We've already heard something of this. It's better understood as a statement or slogan of some of the, that some of the Corinthians were making than something Paul could have said, at least not without significant qualification. Gordon Fee's New International Commentary on the New Testament, which Draper and Rhodes cite, is persuasive here. Or, as J.C. Hurd put it already in the 1960s, this chapter shows Paul's yes, but logic. As much as he can, Paul affirms a faction that was over-exalting celibacy, but realizes this requires a certain giftedness or calling. By no means can it be made the norm. So at each juncture along the way, Paul significantly qualifies the perspectives of these overly zealous abstainers from sex, Within marriage, such abstention should be very limited and purposive, verses 3 to 7. For widows and widowers, I think widowers is the more likely translation of the masculine noun in verse 8 than simply unmarried. It can be more natural, but remarriage is also permitted, verses 8 to 9. Non-Christians who insist on divorcing and leaving a Christian partner need not be stopped, but if the marriage can be kept intact, there are spin-off blessings for all parties, including children, verses 10 to 16. Those not yet married need not marry because of the present distress, which Draper and Rhodes take to mean the coming apostasy, but which could also mean that the time left on earth is short, verse 29 but they scarcely sin by marrying, as the pro-celibacy faction in Corinth would have imagined, verses 25 to 35. And the engaged need not get married, but it is certainly appropriate if they do, verses 36 to 38. Draper and Rhodes think these last two provisions are merely the postponement of marriage so that the man can go on missionary service following the JST but again, this goes well beyond anything the text or its context suggests. Once Joseph Smith decided to make marriage more mandatory than the Bible does, he had to find some way to explain these otherwise problematic passages for his perspective. It's a bit misleading, then, for our authors to write that, quote, C.S. Lewis caught the significance of the Savior's teachings. He taught that single human beings are but half-beings, whom God designed to be combined in pairs, close quote. Lewis did indeed speak of the male and female genders, quote, designed to be combined in pairs, close quote. But as Draper and Rhodes acknowledge in their footnote, it was Plato who used the expression half-being. Lewis never calls a human being a half-being, 
And given God's creation of every person in his image, this claim would be untrue to both Jewish and Christian theology. It's that kind of claim that, sadly, single people too often hear within all different churches, making them feel like second-class citizens at best. The problem of the weaker and stronger brothers and sisters in the context of eating food sacrificed to idols in chapter 8 is treated well in the commentary. The exposition properly disabuses those in any religious tradition who emphasize rights and entitlements more than responsibilities and sacrifices for the sake of others. The only caveat I would introduce here is maybe not even one that applies much in Mormon circles. I know only that evangelicals need it. Paul's implied definition of the weaker sibling here is the person who, when seeing another believer free to participate in some morally neutral activity, is emboldened either to imitate that believer without a clear conscience or to go beyond the morally neutral matter into something that is unambiguously sinful, verses 7 to 13. In my circles, these principles are often erroneously applied to what one writer dubbed the professional weaker brother. That is, the person who makes a habit of objecting to all kinds of new and creative activities, some of them even designed to help believers relate better to non-believers for evangelistic purposes. Yet these professional weaker brothers would never in a million years imitate the practices to which they object, much less go beyond them into actual sinful behavior. Other biblical passages remind us that we must not deliberately offend such people willy-nilly, but these people are not those that Paul is calling weaker brothers or sisters in this chapter, so it's invalid to apply Paul's teaching here to those individuals. Perhaps the most interesting question in chapter 9 to emerge from the commentary is whether the first person plural in verse 5 indicates that Paul was married even when he wrote the letter, rather than widowed as 1 Corinthians 7, 8 to 9 seems to suggest. In other words, when Paul asks if it is only we, Barnabas and Paul, who don't have the right to take a believing wife along with them, is he indicating that he is still married? Draper and Rhodes have already made a good case for this option in their introduction, and it is one that other commentators ought to consider more seriously. What Paul would then be implying is that Barnabas and he simply felt, uh, sorry, simply left their wives at home during their missionary travels. Draper and Rhodes also deal flawlessly with Paul's puzzling use of the Old Testament in 1 Corinthians 9.10, having quoted Deuteronomy 25.4 about not muzzling oxen while they tread out grain, in verse 9, Paul then applies this principle to providing financial support for Christian leaders. The KJV raises all sorts of questions with its rendering or saith he it altogether for our sakes? As if the Mosaic law never intended to refer to cattle at all. But the BYU rendition is the better translation. Isn't he certainly speaking for our benefit? Of course the law was about oxen, but Paul sees a natural parallel in the human realm. He is not providing Deuteronomy's original meaning, but giving a valid contemporary application. Draper and Rhodes explain, quote, the preposition dia with the accusative indicates cause, for our sakes or for us. By the use of that word, Paul moved the application of that scripture from the Old Testament to his time period. The word shows that the apostle took the verse in its higher context of dealing more with humankind than with animals. The apostle accorded the scripture a proper place in showing how the saints were to act generally and how it was to be applied to the specific situation he was in, close quote. In the context of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, on resisting temptation, our commentators offer an excellent extended quote from a 1989 Ensign article by Joseph Worthlin. It ends with these words, quote, 
Be sure you understand that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability to resist. He does not give you challenges that you cannot surmount. He will not ask more than you can do, but may ask right up to your limits so you can prove yourselves. The Lord will never forsake or abandon anyone. You may abandon him, but he will not abandon you. You never need to feel that you are alone, close quote. Perhaps paradoxically, in evangelical circles, these principles are often overly simplified and boiled down to, God will never give you more than you can handle. And communicated in such a way as to suggest we can handle them on our own. Draper and Rhodes make Paul's intent very clear. The only sense in which it is true that God never gives us more than we can handle is that with the temptations, he gives us the empowerment if we let him not to give in to them. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to 16, is perhaps the most challenging segment of Paul's entire letter to interpret. What is going on with head coverings or their absence on women and men? And why does it matter? All interpreters recognize a certain amount of situation-specific instruction here, as do Draper and Rhodes. Four observations on particularly tricky parts of this passage, in my opinion, are exactly on target. First, that women are allowed to pray and prophesy in the congregation, verse 5, certainly gives permission for women to instruct men, as well as other women, in the weekly worship service. Point LDS understand better than some very conservative evangelicals. Second, women are created in God's image every bit as much as men accounting for the lack of symmetry in verses 7 to 8. Man is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Close quote. Woman is not created as the image of man, but also in the image of God. And the statement that woman is the glory of man is not a diminution of her role, but an acknowledgment that, quoting Draper and Rhodes, it is she who brings the man glory. And then what I take to be a slightly lighthearted comment, without her, he would be hard pressed to receive any, close quote. <laughs> Third, the correct translation of the beginning of verse 10, and here I will uh, differ from uh, Kevin's earlier comments, is for this reason, a woman ought to have control over her head, exactly as the BYU rendition puts it. This is not some slogan giving her independent authority, but a summary of Paul's commands thus far in the passage, for the sake of not sending culturally misleading signals by her coiffure or her appearance, the woman in church must wear the proper head covering. If it doesn't send those signals today, it's a matter of indifference. Fourth, Paul immediately adds, because of the angels. <laughs> Why? Most likely because Jews believed them to be watchers and guardians of God's people at worship. The second half of chapter 11 on the Eucharist or sacrament service is not fraught with as many exegetical difficulties. The biggest issue here is cutting through the centuries of overlay of theological interpretation and reading the passage afresh in its original context. It is certainly possible with our authors that when Paul berates the Corinthians for eating and drinking unworthily, verse 27, it is because their, quoting Draper and Rhodes, conduct is not matching the seriousness and solemnity of the occasion, close quote. But the Passover on which this festival built, like the messianic banquet which it foreshadows, are also occasions of great joy and celebration. In context, the Corinthian sin was overeating and over drinking at the expense of the poorer Christians in their gathering, verses 21 to 22. Most Christian churches would experience considerable distress if their leaders consistently taught what 
it seems Paul teaches here, namely, that the people who should refrain from the Lord's table or sacrament are those who are not adequately concerned about their poor fellow believers. Chapter 12 introduces the topic of spiritual gifts, stressing the diversity within the unity of the body of Christ. The only debate of great significance for interpreters here is whether all the gifts Paul discusses are still in force today. Quite different from the milieu in Joseph Smith's time, today Pentecostal churches and movements have spread widely around the globe and the vast majority of the scholarly community on 1 Corinthians recognizes that there are no valid reasons for relegating the so-called charismatic gifts just to the first century or the apostolic era. None of them ever entirely ceased. And since the Azusa Street revival in Los Angeles of 1906, all of them have proliferated in increasing abundance and not merely in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Chapter 13, of course, is often treated as a self-contained poem or rhapsody about love. It is no doubt here where commentators most feel their own impoverished abilities to add anything of great value to Paul's powerful and inspired words. What can be lost sight of, however, is that chapter 13 comes in between chapters 12 and 14. That is to say, Paul is still teaching on the topic of spiritual gifts. But he is insisting that without love, the gifts prove worthless, and that love will abide into eternity when the gifts have finally ceased. Draper and Rhodes nicely summarize Paul's understanding of agape, love, in an excursus on the topic, quote, it will have nothing to do with anything driven by ego or self-interest. Its touch brings to the recipient a new center, a transformation from concern for self to a concern for others and doing the will of the master. Again, the result is a total disinterest in what would be personal advantage. Though advantage may come, that possibility in no way influences love's action. The Savior did not come to please himself, but to please God through assistance to others. The disciples should do the same. Such action is the truest sign of pure love, close quote. I like to quote my former pastor and longtime missionary to the upper Amazon basin of Brazil, Richard Walker. Love is the unsolicited giving of the very best you have on behalf of another, regardless of response. Chapter 14 narrows Paul's focus to the two particularly problematic gifts in the Corinthian church, prophecy and tongues. His overall message is clear, prefer prophecy because it is more immediately intelligible. Draper and Rhodes handle this well, including the puzzling verse 22, where tongues are said to be signs for unbelievers and not for believers. This is not because tongues are more evangelistic in nature. The context makes it clear that some outsiders coming to the church will hear tongues and go away claiming the believers are mad. Rather, in view of the quotation of Isaiah 28, 11 to 12 in the previous verse, in which the foreign tongues of the Assyrians are a sign of judgment in Israel, tongues likewise must be functioning as a sign of judgment in Corinth when they are used without interpretation. Verses 34 to 35 form the other huge exegetical conundrum in this chapter. We've heard reference to it already this morning. Draper and Rhodes survey several of the proposals for explaining how Paul can seemingly silence all women all the time in church, especially after his words to the contrary in chapter 11. With more conservative or complementarian evangelicals, they see the restriction as limited to presiding over the congregation. After all, the context of these two verses is the discussion of tongues, their interpretation, prophecy, and its evaluation which would have ultimately come down to the congregational leaders to determine. 
Worthy of more consideration, nevertheless, is the egalitarian understanding that sees a situation-specific nature to Paul's commands, given how little access women had to formal religious education and the likelihood that they would have asked basic questions disrupting the flow of worship, which were better dealt with in their homes. Chapter 15 creates yet another high point in 1 Corinthians with its lofty teaching about the truth of the bodily resurrection of Jesus and of the coming bodily resurrections of all of his true followers. Our commentator's treatment overall is both accurate and incisive. The two main points were virtually anyone uh, would disagree, not already committed to Joseph Smith's interpretation, are on the baptism for the dead, verse 29, and on the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdoms, derived in part from verse 41. It is true, as certain early church fathers noted, that there were a handful of Greek Christians in and around Corinth practicing proxy baptism, though only for those known to have been Christians in this life who died unbaptized. Paul, however, neither commends nor commands the practice. Instead, for the sake of argument, he assumes its legitimacy and then shows it presupposes belief in a bodily resurrection. After all, immediately after this verse, Paul reasons in exactly the same way from the persecution and hostility he has experienced, verses 30 to 32. And he is neither commending nor commanding that people seek persecution, but simply pointing out the logical consequences of these experiences. Proxy baptism need not have been either heretical or divinely instituted, the only two options Draper and Rhodes leave us with. There are several intermediate possibilities. Verse 41 brings us to the other uniquely Mormon doctrine derived in part from 1 Corinthians 15. Here's where Joseph Smith finds support for his three kingdoms, one with glory like that of the sun, one with glory like that of the moon, and a third with the glory of the stars. But a careful reading of the entire context shows that Paul is not contrasting the varying glories of the heavenly bodies with one another. Instead, he is contrasting the glory of the heavenly bodies with those of various earthly bodies, verse 40. The principles he derives from his analogy likewise all contrast our earthly bodies with our resurrection bodies, rather than distinguishing among three different types of resurrection existence. If it's argued that Paul does indeed observe that the sun, moon, and stars have different degrees of glory, then we should note that he also declares that the stars all differ from each other in glory. If we are to derive three different kinds of resurrection existence from the first clause of verse 41, we should derive an infinite number of kinds of resurrection existence from the second clause. Ironically, this is exactly what Calvinists have taught with their notion of endless degrees of reward in the life to come based on one's works in this life. I'm more convinced by the Lutheran approach that does not read this much into either half of the verse, but recognizes just Paul's main point. Just as there are all kinds of bodies that differ from each other in our current experience of the universe, we should not find it strange to imagine God being able to create a perfected human body for each of us in the life to come. Little needs to be said about 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 to 4. Paul anticipates his much more detailed instructions about the collection for the impoverished saints in Jerusalem in 2 Corinthians 8, 8 to 9. Then he closes the letter with reference to his and others' travel plans, final greetings, and closing exhortations. Perhaps I may be permitted one final textual comment, especially after our wonderful presentation last hour by Kevin, on the holy kiss in verse 20, and this simply reinforces what we heard. Nothing Draper or Rhodes say ever suggests they think that JST represents the original text of the Bible here. But some Mormons, now I've been told the vast majority of them, I was giving you more benefit of the doubt, <laughs> have at times imagined this. 1 Corinthians 16.20 offers a classic disproof of this notion. No scribe, translator, prophet, seer, or anyone else would ever have changed, greet one another with a holy salutation, 
JST, offering a timeless cross-cultural principle to greet one another with a holy kiss, the original Greek and all other bona fide translations, presenting something that works well only in certain cultures. On the other hand, it makes perfect sense to change kiss to salutation to create a timeless principle. Draper and Rhodes capture this accurately as they comment that the kiss, quote, was a show of respect and honor and often used by disciples to honor their teachers. The JST changes this word to salutation, thus making Paul's request conform more to Western and modern practices, close quote. The JST is not a translation. It is an interpretation at times with supplementary material added, and it deserves to be called that in 21st century English. The BYU rendition is a highly accurate translation, and it deserves to be called a translation. <laughs> but of course, it's easier for me to say this as an outsider than for those inside Mormonism, even those who may agree with me. As our commentators close their volume, they observe another long quote that I love. The final two verses emphasize Paul's mutual themes of charis, grace, and agape, love. Indeed, grace has been a bright silver thread that has run through the tapestry of the whole epistle. It is from the grace of God that Christ-like love flows, a love that is the golden thread that has bound the fabric of the whole piece together. Such love is more than a transient feeling, but an enduring attitude of concern and care that pushes one to do whatever is necessary for the spiritual and eternal well-being of the other. Paul knows that love personally, he knows that love personally, and expresses it with both sincerity and solemnity. In spite of all the problems certain members of the church have caused him, it has not lessened his love for them. He loves them all, not only the weak, but also the strong, not only his friends, but also his detractors. He has preached nothing but Christ and him crucified, but he has explored all the ramifications of this doctrine. In doing so, he has exposed and highlighted the underlying, overreaching, final, and most beautiful of its aspects, that of self-sacrificing love. Paul, being filled with the supernal virtue, loves the Corinthian saints and Christo Jesu in Christ Jesus, the source of all such love, close quote. With this commentary, like Paul's letter, sorry, with this, the commentary, like Paul's letter, comes to a close. These are fitting final paragraphs to end the work on an inspiring note and to summarize the main themes of the epistle. The editors of the BYU New Testament commentary series have made it clear that they want to present to the public rigorous biblical scholarship and edifying personal devotion. Usually, these come in two separate consecutive sections of the commentary on each passage labeled notes and comments and analysis and summary, respectively. Much of the time, the distinctively Mormon reflections are found only in the second of these sections. This is probably the best that can be done, given the desire to continue to present not just relevant cross-references from the standard works, but a wide swath of quotations and opinion from key LDS leaders throughout Mormon history. The occasional disconnect between these quotations and what the Bible actually says are not as common or as glaring as they often seemed to me to be while I was working through the Revelation commentary. And even then, the disconnect hardly struck me on a majority of the quotations, just on a noticeable minority. I sense this disjunct even less in 1 Corinthians. Partly, this is due to my understanding of how readily Joseph Smith, for example, could have derived baptism for the dead and the three kingdoms from the relevant passages in 1 Corinthians 15, even though I find such derivation unpersuasive. Partly is because the other instances, when it occurs, affect the interpretation of more minor details within a passage rather than their main points. And more so than with Revelation, there were occasions when I thought to myself, there's an interpretation worth considering, as with the debate over whether Paul could have still been married when he wrote 1 Corinthians. I understand that the primary audience for this series is the LDS community, 
But given the original desire of some to have the series also be sufficiently scholarly and integrated in perspective that it might commend itself to the outside world as it studies the New Testament to determine its meaning and not just to see what the LDS party line thinks about its meaning, the commentary on 1 Corinthians has taken a few additional steps toward this goal. And again, compared to anything else the Latter-day Saint world has produced, these volumes have made major advances. I do not believe there is a celestial kingdom separate from a terrestrial kingdom, separate from a celestial kingdom. Mormons, of course, do. In that light, given the fidelity of this series to mainstream LDS thought, this is truly a celestial commentary. <laughs> there is nothing that would place its authors in jeopardy of making it only to the terrestrial or celestial kingdoms. <laughs> Given the light years of advances beyond what previous Mormon projects of this nature have made, it remains equally celestial. For these reasons, I have entitled this review a celestial commentary on 1 Corinthians. In terms of the whole gamut of commentaries available today on 1 Corinthians, if celestial can be used simply as a synonym for that which is the most excellent, accurate, and helpful overall, if terrestrial can mean that which is regularly on target but has some glitches and oddities in it, and if telestial can be redefined as that which has some truth and value in it but overall isn't all that great, then I would still have to rank Draper and Rhodes' work as terrestrial. And if that doesn't seem like high enough praise, I need to add that many, especially the older, shorter works from historic Christian circles, in my opinion, merit only the label celestial. Thank you for putting up with an outsider. <laughs> Well, uh, let's, uh, I think, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Michael and Richard if they would like to ask any questions in response to what's been said. There's a microphone up here if you'd like to come, both of you, and uh, take a minute. I think that's a uh, uh, privilege we can uh, take some time for. But any of you, I'm sure you're all dying to ask Brother Blomberg some questions. <laughs> And uh, we do welcome him as Brother Blumberg. But again, if you'd like to uh, write these questions down, uh, I'll see that you uh, uh, get good answers. But would either of you like to uh, begin with a comment or question? Uh, uh, as uh, we've done a commentary, and quite frankly, as we have reached into new territory, we've been acutely aware of uh, problems and concerns of writing a faithful commentary, trying to bring in the best of uh, scholarship throughout the world and standing on the shoulders of giants, but also uh, true to be true to LDS uh, gospel and to our own traditions. Uh, we talked about the uh, young man, uh, the incestual relationship there. Uh, but we did, uh, Michael and I were not aware, uh, to say, uh, our decision there to bring in this idea of blood atonement was uh, quite deliberate. But we also tried to make sure it was fairly soft in there. We didn't, didn't want to go overboard, but uh, when you have a president of the church or somebody as prolific a writer as Joseph Fielding Smith, it, 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 I certainly want to, wouldn't want a Latter-day Saint to say, I wonder if they're even familiar that Joseph Fielding Smith lived. Now, we were well aware and knew what his teaching, so we wanted to bring that side of that kind of thing. So you do see that thread throughout the commentary. No, not particularly so. Uh, overall then, uh, we were thrilled, uh, given Professor Blumberg's extremely heavy load, that uh, he would respond uh, in this way to us, and we found that his critique was extremely valuable, and uh, we have written that into the EPA version that's coming out. Okay, so thank you very much. Michael, any? Uh... We'll hear from Richard and Michael at the end of the day. Yes, yes. <laughs>
but uh, I'm, I'm, there we go. I'm in awe being called celestial. <laughs> we'll even take terrestrial. Terrestrial is good. You, you can't hear me? Yeah. 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 No, she says she can't. She's right in front of me. And I'm on the front row. <laughs> well, I, I, I really don't have anything else to say. I, you know, we, we got feedback from, from uh, Craig uh, a couple months ago, and, and it was just invaluable for us uh, uh, to, to have, uh, you know, to write a commentary and have a non-LDS uh, uh, expert in that very field look at what we have done and give us, you know, uh, such positive feedback and, and helpful feedback was, was just invaluable and, and I think our commentary uh, is improved significantly based upon what he was able to, to uh, do for us. So, And uh, it's nice to see another brother with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, once again, let's thank uh, Brother Blomberg for all of his comments.